you know, we are, we are in the home stretch, to use another sports metaphor, we're kind of in the home stretch of the study through the, the book of Revelation. Uh, we started this the very first full weekend in January, and it's been uh, quite a journey to now, a journey for me, a uh, journey for you as well as you, if you've been with us during this time. There's a lot of words you could use to describe the apocalypse. Uh, challenging, confusing, uh, hopeful. We're going to use um, a positive word, hopeful, scary. Some people say parts of it seem scary. I've heard some say heavy, like just messages can be heavy. And I, I would add the word misunderstood because oftentimes it's, it's not uncommon for, for pastors authors, bloggers, you know, Bible studies, they get together and look at this book to, to gravitate towards the most sensational interpretations possible, almost forgetting at times that Revelation had an audience before it had us. And so if, if we want to discern what the book means for us today, we have to do the work to figure out best we can what it meant for them back then. And that can, that's true with all parts of the Bible. With Revelation, that can be especially challenging. And so I've tried to make note through the series Hey, here's something that we can, you know, we can know. The, the symbolism here is pretty clear. We can know. We can hold this firmly, confidently. Uh, here's something, the times where we say maybe it's, it's not quite as clear what John's communicating. Here are two or three ways people look at it. And wherever you land or we land, let's hold it a little more loosely and humbly. And then whenever questions arise, because inevitably they do, we keep returning to this refrain of, hey, let's, let's not um, forget the big picture. And in terms of big picture, Revelation tells a story, and every story has a structure. And so the, the simplest way to follow through the, the apocalypse, or to work our way through, is to follow the, the four visions that John, the author, receives from God. And so four times throughout the book, he makes a note, I, he was in the Spirit, or he was carried by the Spirit, and, and God's Spirit reveals to him someone or something that is important to the storyline of the book. So in chapter one, John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day on the island of Patmos, and he sees revealed uh, Jesus, the son, and he sees Jesus in all of his glory, and he interacts with seven churches to whom the letter is written, and that's chapters one, two, and three. In chapter four, John says, I was in the spirit, I was carried up to heaven, and he sees revealed God's throne, and so God's worship for who he is, chapter four, for what he's done, chapter five, and then for several chapters, we read about uh, just a lot of different things described as seals and trumpets and bowls. And we've been living there for several weeks because that's the longest vision of the book, chapter four, all the way to the end of chapter 16. We finished that last week. And some of it can be confusing or scary, but we keep saying God remains on the throne. All of this takes place from the perspective of the throne room of God. Now, today, we are ready for uh, the third vision, much shorter than the one we just finished. And vision number three reveals the harlot. And so this is, how, this is how it begins. Revelation 17, we're going to read verse 1 through 3 here to start. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, we just covered those last week, came and said to me, Come, and I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute. I'll use the word harlot more often. Uh, but great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual morality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And it says in verse 3, and he carried me away in the spirit. So there's kind of the, the marker, uh, new part of the, the book we're getting into. He carried me away to a new location, into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. Now, if you're just joining us for the first time, this is how Revelation talks. It, it uses a lot of different evocative imagery and symbols. Uh, we'll get into some of it as we work our way through. Um, and we'll talk about the identity of the woman and the beast in just a, a moment. But what we see in this chapter, it's important for us just to notice up front, what we see is the unmasking of evil. In, in some ways, the harlot is what's revealed, but in some ways it's evil that is revealed. It's unmasked. And, and that's really important because evil likes to hide, doesn't it? Evil doesn't want to be seen for what it is. And so it uses whatever it has available to disguise itself. And, and that's, that's why a great deal of crime takes place at night under the cover of darkness. It's why, it's why those who commit crimes oftentimes will wear some kind of covering. They'll wear a mask or something to kind of obscure their true identity. Um, it's why adult bookstores have no windows. So, so I see as I drive past, right? Like, you know, you drive, just to be clear here, as you drive past, you can tell there's no 
you know, there's no windows. You can't see inside. You, people can't see who's in, what's going on. You can't see out. It, it's why domestic abuse takes place in private, um, often by people who publicly appear rather gentle towards their family, but there's something taking place behind closed doors. Um, it's why as a society we often use euphemisms to describe evil, Sl slight turns of phrases that are designed to um, make the evil seem somehow less evil. And so we might say things uh, like, I, 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 didn't have an, I didn't have an affair, I, I, didn't, I didn't cheat on my spouse, I had a fling, right? It wasn't an affair, just a fling, it wasn't, it wasn't that big a deal. Or we, you know, a group of people could say, well, we're, we're, we're not racist, we're, we're just patriotic, or we're, we're nationalists. Uh, people might say, I, I didn't lie, I just bent the, bent the truth. And there are a lot of different ways that we speak this way to try to make what happened not, not seem quite uh, as bad as it really is. This is the first thing Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden when they sinned is they, they sewed fig leaves together and they covered themselves up. Uh, evil, this is what evil does. Evil tries to hide. And Revelation 17 unmasks the evil to show us the horror that exists behind all of the marketing, PR, and spin so that we would, we would flee the evil that is taking place. So it's, we kind of get past this glitzy public persona to see the seedy underbelly. And in the process, we also see in these chapters, we're going to look through chapter 17, 18, 19, kind of a three-part story. We see what God intends to do about it as well. And there's some, there's some really uh, good hope here and encouragement for us we'll, we'll see in these chapters but there's also some really serious warnings and challenges for us and it all comes you may be caught it in the first three verses it all comes in fairly graphic language so so let the reader beware this morning right this is one of those times when scripture uses harsh words uh, to describe harsh realities and so let's let's start here reading chapter 17 I'll have, you, I'll have you stand in a moment towards the end of the chapter I want to make a few comments as we read so I won't have you stand quite yet but we've made it the goal as we teach through the apocalypse to, to read through um, the whole book together because Revelation is the only book that proclaims a blessing over those who read it together um, in worship. Blessed are those who read uh, and hear and keep these words. And so um, we, we will read a, a lot of scripture today. If you're new, we normally don't maybe read quite as much as we are today, but we're gonna look at this in three parts. We start in Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and, and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon, the great mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Now the woman here, she's, she's described as Babylon, but, but she's, not, she's not Babylon. Babylon didn't exist at this time the way it had it done in the Old Testament. This woman is the embodiment of Babylon. That's how an apocalypse works. It uses, at least Revelation uses Old Testament imagery to communicate its point. And so Babylon becomes in the Old Testament kind of this catchword for evil. Revelation uses it a lot. Um, but the woman is not Babylon. She, she represents Babylon. And I'm going to suggest to you as the morning goes on that, that the beast that we see here is Rome. That's really not that controversial. We saw the beast in chapter 13. Um, we talked a lot about the imagery then. We'll see some more imagery today. The beast, not very controversial to say that the beast here is Rome. We'll discuss it. Um, I'm also gonna suggest that this woman, who's the embodiment of, of, of evil in Babylon, uh, she's described as a city, and I'm gonna suggest to you that that city is Jerusalem, right, the people of God. That, that, that's a little more controversial. We'll get into that in a moment, but um, she's described here as, as Babylon. When I saw her, verse, second half of verse 6, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. 
And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. And if you've, if you've ever been to Rome, I, I have not been to Rome, would love to go sometime, but, but even today, just like in the first century, geographically, the, the seven hills of Rome um, are, are a feature of, of the city. It talks about the seven hills here. Uh, they, have, they are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other is yet to come. When he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. So we're getting a little more obscure here, but uh, the kings are likely... Uh, the Caesars, and there are ways that people kind of number, number those, but they're all, they're all kind of pointing at the first century. We're not going to get into all of that um, today. Let, let's stand together as we close out the end of chapter 17. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal authority to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. So word of the Lord, amen. <clears throat> you may have a seat. Uh, a lot happening here. Again, a pretty graphic language. We'll talk about some of it. Revelation 17, it's the equivalent um, of, of you and I walking into a clan rally and grabbing the leader's mask and pulling it off so that they're exposed, evil unmasked. This, this is the equivalent of, a, of a, an accountant publishing the books of a, of a company that's misleading its investors and um, not being ab above board with their resources. Like, this is the equivalent of a passerby taking their phone and filming something they see on the street, maybe some kind of injustice, and then uploading it to the internet for other people to, to see. This is un the unmasking of evil, and it's all portrayed or pictured as this uh, great harlot, which is, which is really good Old Testament uh, symbolism. And we're told in verse 18 that the harlot represents a city. There are, there are two prime candidates that, uh, that she could be. Some believe the city is Rome, and you can make a really good case for that. A lot of the evidence comes in chapter 18, where the woman is described as this great uh, empire who makes the nations rich through uh, her trade. And that sounds very uh, Rome-like, very um, especially in the first century, in terms of an empire that would make the nations rich through trade. But other people have said, well, hold on, wait a minute. If Revelation 13 identifies this beast as uh, Rome, and we see the same beast here in chapter 17, how, how can the harlot also be Rome? Like, how, how is the woman you know, riding the same place that she is? Like, how can both of these be Rome? And even more, verse 16 says the beast hates the prostitute. So if, if both beast and the harlot envision, you know, Roman Empire, how does that even work? And so this has led some interpreters to suggest the harlot isn't Rome at all. It's actually Jerusalem. If, if it's a great city, it's Jerusalem, the, the people of God. Now, evidence for this comes from chapter 11, where the great city is described as the place where Jesus was crucified, which of course was Jerusalem, right? It wasn't, it wasn't Rome, and so we already have the great city called Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, God's people, because of their unfaithfulness to him, are often described as uh, a great uh, prostitute, sometimes in language that is, if you can believe it, more graphic than what we read here. Um, go read Ezekiel 23 later uh, in your own time. If you're over 18, go read Ezekiel 23. Chalk it up as, that was a joke, but chalk it up as a uh, you know, one of those passages where you go, like, this is actually in, in the Bible, but it's described in graphic detail. And, and maybe most telling of all, back in chapter 12, we saw a woman fleeing into the wilderness, right, to, to escape a dragon. 
And we said then that, that the woman, she represented the people of God, and she's fleeing the dragon, who we're told is the devil. So th this, this is one of those places that we could be really confident about what the imagery means. The, the people of God flee into the wilderness to escape the devil. And now in chapter 17, John, carried by the Spirit into the wilderness, he sees a woman drunk, riding one of the devil's lackeys, like this beast, and benefiting from and partaking in the beast's sins. Right? Last time we saw the woman, she's people of God fleeing, and now John sees her again. John's astonished when he sees the woman. I like the way one commentator puts it. He says, John's astonished to see her because of her offensive appearance, yes, but even more so because behind the garish makeup, he thinks he recognizes her. And so he wipes his eyes, and he looks, and he says, is that you, Mom? Because John looks, he sees the woman, and he recognizes, this, that's my people. Right, this is my heritage. And John, John is appalled at, at what he sees. Uh, uh, explain to me what's going on this way. When, when Sarah and I dated in college or started to date, we went on a date on a, on a spring, uh, spring afternoon, kind of like right now, early spring, and ended up being a lot colder than we thought it was going to be. And so I ended up giving her uh, my, my hoodie that she could wear, kind of my, my college hoodie, and she, she took it, put it on, and she never gave it back to me. Uh, it's, still in her, it's still in our closet, but it's on her side of the closet. Like, it's now her hoodie. Um, somehow that, that happened. And at the time, that was pretty common. If you were kind of dating someone, oftentimes they would, you know, wear your hoodie. That was a really big, kind of a big deal. I don't know if it's a big deal now or not, but if you saw someone wearing someone else's hoodie, you kind of knew, like, they belong together. They're an item. And so here, God's people flee into the wilderness to escape the devil but a short time later, they, re they return wearing his hoodie, right? That, that's what John sees, God's people kind of caught in the act of this spiritual adultery. Revelation is showing us the grotesqueness of evil once it is brought into the light. Rome is not uh, the light of the world. Rome is not togas and luxury and political acumen. Rome is a scarlet beast with blasphemous names and you know, seven heads and ten horns. It's like as if Revelation is saying, I want you to see how lurid this city really is and what takes place here. And in the same way, Jerusalem isn't the city on a hill that can't be hidden. It's not a place of joy and rest and worship that we read about in the Psalms. It's, it's a prostitute arrayed in purple and scarlet, holding a cup of abominations and drunk on the blood of the saints. And you go, that sounds really harsh, Right? Well, the Old Testament speaks this way frequently when God's people have wandered off into sin. Even Jesus says in Luke chapter 13 of the city of Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to hit. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and yet you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken. So we have Rome portrayed as a scarlet beast, um, ridden by a prostitute who's likely Jerusalem. They look like a partnership, right? They're, they're a team. This Princeton basketball playing as one unit here, kind of all, you know, all together. They're, they're a team. And yet then we're told the beast actually hates the woman. You know, and in verse 16, the beast turns on the harlot to devour her and then ends up destroying her with fire, like kind of just almost like breathes out this fire and destroys the woman. And you go, that's so weird. Like, it's such weird imagery, very graphic. But if you know your history, this is exactly what happened. In, a in AD 70, Rome conquered Jerusalem, burnt the temple to the ground. Uh, that's why if you go to Jerusalem today, there's very little of that temple remaining. There's a little bit, the western wall, we call it the Wailing Wall. So you and I read Revelation here, and we should note the language describes a very specific period of time, a very specific series of events in the first century. What, what we see here either has just happened or is about to happen, depending on where you date the book. Some people think the book was written in the 50s or 60s, and so maybe this was predicting what's going to happen. Some people think it was written in the 90s, and that this is kind of looking back to what happened, but either way, the value of the apocalypse is both that it speaks to what took place in the first century and that we can apply that truth to our own day because we recognize that this is what the devil is always doing. 
Like the devil is always trying to destroy God's people, the church, from the inside out by leading her into idolatry and sexuality and greed and violence. We see it in the scriptures. We see it in, in church history. We see it in today's news. We see it in the temptations of our own hearts. And so Revelation speaks to first century realities, but also speaks to our own time. It unmasks evil, but not just for the sport of unmasking evil. It unmasks the evil so that we would flee. We wouldn't take part in it. And that becomes very clear um, in chapter 18 because God unmasks evil in chapter 17 and he judges it in chapter 18 along with a call for us to come out of her. Right? Don't partake in evil's sins. And so I'm going to read you chapter 18 here, Revelation 18, I told you we're going to look at this story kind of in three parts, and, and we're just going to kind of we're going to read through this whole chapter um, straight through. It's a little bit um, it's a little bit longer. Again, we're reading through the apocalypse as we teach, so just stick with me here for a minute and, and cap, catch the big picture, and I'll help you do it. Even if uh, even if some of the details you're like, what's happening? After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living." Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup that she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as queen. I am no widow and no mourning I shall ever see. For this reason, her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she'll be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold and silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood and bronze and iron and marble, Cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and slaves. That is human souls. The fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gain wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafaring men and sailors and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. They said, what city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, alas, alas, it's the third time We've seen that for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any kind will be found in you no more. And the sound of mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth. And all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints. And all who have been slain 
on the earth. So huge picture of God judging uh, the woman, the, the city. Uh, here it sounds a little bit more like Rome, and I don't even know that we have to choose between the two. Sometimes Revelation can work on a, on a few levels. So in some ways, maybe the harlot is Jerusalem. In some ways, maybe it is Rome. They've become almost another. But for the church, what we just read, this, this is great encouragement, right? Because all evil will be judged one day, and no one gets away with it. And so verse 20 says, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints, that's us, and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her, right? Yay, God's judged evil. This is good news, but this is also a great warning because all evil will be judged, right? and no one gets away with it, all right? Not, not me, not you. And that's why Revelation 18, in addition to saying like, hey, you know, God is judged, this is good, also says, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you partake in her sins and lest you share in her plagues. We saw last week plagues uh, meaning judgments. And so we, we see here the need to make sure that by virtue of living in Babylon, Right, living in a world where, where evils happen, um, that we don't ourselves participate, and so in the process, like become Babylon our, ourselves. Like this is what Revelation is addressing. Living in Babylon can corrupt the saints. And maybe you feel this at times in your life, right? Like a, a pull towards you know, values of the, of the day or the time or the world or the thing that we live in, like that go against maybe core convictions, but you also feel this pull. Living in Babylon can corrupt the saints. So this is a warning for people who think, well, hey, you know what? We are the people of God, but hey, it doesn't matter because we're saved by grace through faith, and so like this is just the way the world works, and so we might think, hey, no big deal, right? White collar fraud, no big deal. Sexual morality, no big deal. Gossip, no big deal. Domestic violence, no big deal. Hate speech, no big deal. Uh, what we do with the unborn, uh, no big deal. A number of times, chapter 18 mentions luxury. Right? Luxury, no, no big deal, right? Luxury is a selling point for us. I'm, we, we say we're glad we live where we live because of look at all that we have. Luxury is a selling point, but it gets thrown down here multiple times. It's really important that we recognize the beast and false prophet Man, they have had a positive economic influence on the harlot. She's arrayed in purple and scarlet, but they've had a negative spiritual influence. Right? The prosperity gospel is, is alive and as powerful today as ever. This idea that, that God, when God blesses us, he wants to bless us primarily economically, but this is proof economic blessing does not equate to spiritual blessing. So just because you, you love God doesn't mean God's gonna bless you economically, and it also means it also means if for some reason you find yourself in a difficult place economically, it doesn't mean that God's punishing you, right? That's not the blessing that God is seeking to give. And so there's a warning here to be mindful of, of the limits of luxury, right? We're not, we're not saying all resources are bad, but, but the limits of luxury and how it can grab our hearts. There's a warning here. There's a warning here to be mindful of temptation, to resist sin and resist the temptation to compromise. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, just a reminder, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed. Right? God, um, he's gonna unmask the evil or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you've said in the dark shall be heard in the light and what you've whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Evil unmasked. And so Revelation wants us, what the book wants us to do is endure. Right? We're, we're enduring through the challenges and things that come our way. It doesn't want us to get swept up in the subtleties of the enemy's attack and so you know, it warns us here, one day, everything that is not of God is gonna be, come, it's gonna come crashing down, and it's gonna shock people when it happens. The, the great city falls in chapter 18, people can't believe it, right? They thought their good fortune was gonna last forever. They thought things were just gonna keep continuing as they've been forever. We saw that last week, people scoffing at the, re the return of Jesus. Right, when's he gonna return? He's not returned. Things, things will just go on as they've always been, and then yet God's, Judgment comes in a moment. There are six no mores uh, mentioned in chapter 18. We read them at the end, like no more, no more, no more. 
they parallel um, six no mores that come up in chapter 21 with the new heaven and the new earth. We get to 21, there's a passage that maybe you're familiar with where it talks about there's no more sea, which sea is kind of this chaos. No, no more sea, no more chaos, no more crying, no more pain, no more tears, no more mourning, no more death, right? For the, the former things have passed away. And so there's, there's, there's this idea, chapter 18, no more sin is going to exist. All evil will be exposed and judged. And then when the new heavens come, like, no more pain, no more death. And in light of this, you know, promise, the removal of evil and the arrival of the new creation, chapter 19, heaven rejoices in worship. Heaven praises God for his judgment of the harlot and the beast and the prophet. And so let's read the third part of our story. Revelation chapter 19, this is what it says. Again, I, I thought about trying to bump 19 to next week, but it's, it fits best to look at here. After this, after he sees the judgment, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with him or her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God almighty reigns. That, that's um, Hanel's Messiah, right? You recognize that? It's a praising God for the removal of evil. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, no, 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 you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. You'll notice some of these, all these words have been used to describe Jesus in the book. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head were many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, which will strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's about over. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice. He called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come and gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slaves, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was seated on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive in the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Uh, last week, if you were here in chapter 16, we saw a picture of Armageddon. Revelation 16 mentioned Armageddon, this great battle between good and evil um, at the end of time. And I noted then that the battle is mentioned in 16, but then we just hear the words, it's done. Like, we don't need to... It's not something we, should, we need to worry about, you know, in the sense of like, what all is going on? It's, it's just done. When the battle comes, Jesus achieves victory. But we didn't see it described at all. Here in chapter 19, we get a little more description uh, with a focus on the judgment of the harlot, beast, and false prophet. Jesus comes riding in. He's victorious. He judges these three. We're going to see a, a third view of the battle next week, chapter 20, when Satan is judged once and for all, but when, when this judgment comes in chapter 19, heaven rejoices 
because evil is removed from the picture. And so Revelation 19 is kind of this worship service. And, and I like how Eugene Peterson describes these chapters because it will help us maybe make this final application for our own lives. Eugene Peterson says, harlot may be a sexual term, but in Revelation 17, 18, and 19, the great harlot image is not about sex. It is a metaphor for worship gone wrong. What these chapters are doing are forcing God's people to examine their worship. Like, where is our heart? Does God have our heart, or have we given it somewhere else? You, you may recall, if you've, if you've been with us from the beginning of the series, that when we looked at the seven churches, um, I showed you this funky little graph, and I said, this is gonna be important later, so we're gonna pull up a picture from the screenshot there. We talked about the seven churches, and how when Jesus gave them rebukes, they, they kind of all focused towards the middle. And so the, the first church and the last church had kind of forgotten their, you know, they'd forgotten their first love. Laodicea had grown lukewarm. The second church and sixth church didn't receive any rebuke from Jesus. They were holding true. The third church and the fourth church, one had, um, one had false teaching, one had false deeds. And in the middle, the church of Thyatira was running the risk of committing what Scripture called the, the sexual or the spiritual adultery. And I said, this, this is gonna come up later when we see the harlot, like, because the harlot is a warning for the people of God that, that we, we, we could always run the risk of gravitating from our obedience to Christ and giving it to the day in which we live or the place in which we live or, or someone else. And so the question is, are we staying true to Christ? Again, who has our heart? So, sometimes holiness and obedience to Jesus um, we can think of it almost as punishment, right? Like I love God, I wanna do what God wants me to do, but like, look at all this other stuff that I, I wanna be doing this, uh, but, I, but I can't or I'm not supposed to. Revelation 17, 18, and 19 help us with that because it tells us sin always makes itself look better and more enticing than it really is. And later when it's exposed, like we find out it's, it's, it's never what it promised it would be. Sin looks good in the moment, it's never what it promises that it is. And the bad thing is, by the time that we recognize this, it's almost, oftentimes we've gone too far. And it's done significant damage in our life, the lives of people that we love. It's, it's sometimes almost become part of us, like we see here. And maybe this morning, maybe this morning you feel that. You found yourself swept up in evil, swept up in sin, and, and you, you kind of wonder, or you've been, where, where do you stand with God? You, you feel guilt and shame and Sorrow, and these, maybe these verses don't seem to help a whole lot because there is serious warning here, right, of God's judgment against these things. But again, I'd remind you, there's also encouragement. Evil will be unmasked. Evil will be judged. Evil will be removed by God. In anticipation of that day, we can remove evil now from our life by God's grace. Right? He invites us to come to him. I, I love how First John puts it. The same author of Revelation, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we don't need to fear bringing our sin or bringing our stuff to God. Like Jesus will deal with it for us. Like he, he will take it. He will he'll wash us clean of all unrighteousness, but he's gonna deal with it now or he's gonna deal with it later. And what we see here is it's much better for him to deal with it now. So this call, come out of her, my people. Don't partake in the sins and the evils of your day. This is an invitation to us as the people of God. And it leads to worship, right? It leads to worship. So what I want to invite you to do, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. And we want to take a minute just uh, really in silence before God, before we, before we give him worship. I want to invite you just to, to close your eyes as we pray. And I want to just ask the question, um, if there's something that you need to bring into the light of God's grace, um, a sin, an, an evil, something that you've gotten swept up in, and maybe you've hidden it even from the people who are closest to you. Well, we see today that things are gonna be revealed and things are gonna be judged. Like This is a chance to confess our sins to God. He's faithful and just to forgive. May we look more like Jesus than the, the world in which we live. May we grow closer and closer to him. Our hearts belong to him, not give our hearts to someone else. God, we come before you in um, 
humility. We come before you in, um, if necessary, repentance, bringing our, uh, our sin to you and asking you to cleanse us and make us whole. Because as your people, we, we don't, we, we don't want to we don't want to give our hearts somewhere else. So God, we give our hearts to you in this moment. We ask that because of these promises, we would be humble before you and then worship you for the promise that's gonna come. You are gonna one day judge and remove sin from this world. There'll be no more sin or crying or sorrow or pain. Death, those are the former things that'll pass away. So God, we thank you for that. We now praise you in your name for what you've done through your son Jesus and all God's people said, amen.